Today we are wrapping up our summer series. You guys know where we've been in this series called Is It True? All throughout the summer. And throughout this series, we've been doing that. We've been asking ourselves the question, is it true? And we've been taking cultural statements and questions and ideas and holding them up to Scripture and saying, is this actually true according to what the Bible says? And so we've addressed some interesting topics this summer. We talked about the idea, love is love. Is that actually true? We talked about this idea, God just wants me to be happy. And we talked about the idea, my body, my choice. On our podcast, in the middle of the week, we've addressed some other topics that we didn't have time to get to here on Sunday. We talked about things like, what does biblical marriage look like? We talked about things just this last week. How do I have good boundaries on social media, especially when people write things that I really don't like? And so we're going to keep talking about these kind of topics for a few more weeks on our podcast because you guys keep sending in such interesting questions. So for the next three weeks on our podcast, we'll keep going with the Is It True series, and we're going to answer the questions. Uh, the first one that we're going to answer is about church hurt. What is church hurt, and what do we do with it? And then we're going to talk on our podcast. Uh, we had a, uh, one episode about what does biblical marriage look like, and that raised some questions for us that we're going to try to address in another episode of how do I live as a faithful Christian spouse even if my partner isn't? And then in our final episode on our podcast for this series, we're going to talk about, is the Old Testament still relevant for us today? So you might want to tune in. We'll do that over the month of September as best we can. I think we've been having a good time or at least a challenging time as we go through these topics this summer. And I think that it's a pivotal point for us as a church as we now come face to face with the culture that God has actually specifically called us to live in. He specifically put you and me in this time, in this specific context. And so we can't be dismayed when we look at the world around us, but instead we should be recognizing that God has actually equipped us with everything that we need to live holy lives, even in the midst of the difficult culture that we find ourselves in today. And so it actually becomes imperative for us to start asking these kind of questions and having these kind of conversations. Like, is it really true what culture is saying? Is it really true these ideas that my friends or my family members seem to be pushing on me? And how do all of these things stack up against Scripture? This morning, we're going to talk about what I would call maybe the absolutely least helpful thing you could ever say to somebody. Some of you probably have said it. I'm sure I have said it. And we always are well-meaning when we say this statement. And I'm actually excited to talk about this topic specifically today at the end of the summer and heading into the fall because we all know this is where our lives become very busy. Our lives are going to get busier and busier and busier and suddenly it will be Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's and March break and Easter and all of those kind of things. And then we're back at next summer. uh, We know that generally in the fall, one thing piles up on top of the next, on top of the next. And it seems like it's too much sometimes for us to handle. And so my hope and my prayer as I've been preparing this message for the last few days is that you would find freedom from the pressures of daily life. That you would really find freedom today in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So before we dive in, could we pray together? Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. Would you lead us and guide us and would you transform our hearts? Would you change our minds if that's needed today? I ask, Holy Spirit, would you bring us peace and liberation and freedom? And all of this only comes when we see you rightly, God. All of this is just a result of knowing you and actually trusting that you are who you are. And so would we see you rightly this morning and would we take you at your word? Give us strength and boldness for the place that you have called us to specifically and the things that you are asking us specifically, each one of us, to walk out. Thank you that you're with us in the midst of it all. Anoint the things that I say today so that they would hit the mark 
and accomplish exactly what you want to accomplish this morning. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, I want to talk to you about the seemingly innocent and, like I said, typically well-meaning but absolutely untrue statement, God won't give you more than you can handle. This statement is closely related to another statement that you will probably hear more often, especially in pop culture today, and it's this idea that you are enough. You see, these two statements are quite closely related to each other because one of them talks about who we are, you are enough, and the other one talks about what we do or how we handle what we do. God won't give you more than you can handle. And both of these statements are typically well-meaning despite being absolutely dismissive of the person's circumstances. And what you'll find as we go through Scripture is that neither of these statements stand up. In fact, if you really break down what these statements are all about, God won't give you more than you can handle, and you are enough, if you actually imagine that you're saying this to somebody, it's true that at first it sounds liberating. But in actuality, this leads to nothing but bondage. These statements are typically used when you have a friend or a loved one who is going through a difficult time. How many of you have ever had somebody say one of these things to you? Yeah, it's usually when you're going through a difficult time and it seems like your entire life is imploding around you. You're stressed out. And so people throw these quips out at, out at us and they say, don't worry, God won't give you more than you can handle. Or maybe there's a first-time mom overwhelmed with being a mom for the very first time, and people are saying to her, don't worry, you're enough. And we're well-meaning when we say these kind of things, but let's remember how it actually felt when someone said it to us. I mean, really, how helpful was it the last time you lost your job or you lost a loved one and it was in the midst of work's busiest season? Or when your child was born with a mental or a physical deficiency and you were struggling at work and there were family issues on the side of that, how helpful was it, really, when your entire life seemed to be crashing in around you on every side and someone said, don't worry, God won't give you more than you can handle. Don't worry, you've got this. You're enough. What you'll find as you sit and you think about these statements is that, uh, that although we are trying to be liberating and kind, both of these statements keep us in bondage. Statements like this, is they both are in essence enforcing this idea that I must have it within myself to overcome what's happening in my life. I'm enough, so I should be able to sort this out. What you're telling me is that in the midst of all the stressors of life, I need to sort out what to do with it. When you tell me God won't give me more than I can handle, but my entire life seems to be crashing in around me, or I'm experiencing the death of a loved one, and you're telling me God won't give me more than I can handle, then what you're telling me is I better handle it. Otherwise, God wouldn't have given it to me. I can sort it all out myself. And sure, it might sound reassuring at first, but it's actually quite defeating when we feel like we have to handle all that this world throws at us. It actually binds us up when we keep insisting that we, mere human beings, are enough for whatever this world throws our way. And so what does the Bible have to say about this? What, what do you see? Where can you find it in Scripture? Tell me, where does it say in Scripture that God won't give me more than I can handle? Or an easier one, where does it say in Scripture, you are enough? Yeah, that's the answer. Nowhere. It's nowhere in there. It's written nowhere in Scripture that God won't give you more than you can handle. 
And it's written nowhere in Scripture that you are enough. In fact, I would say if you actually read Scripture, specific verses, and you look at the whole narrative of Scripture altogether, it teaches quite the opposite. You see, if you search Scripture for the answer to the statement, you are enough, what you will actually find is things like Romans 3.23, that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That doesn't sound like being enough. What you'll find is things like Isaiah 53, verse 6. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us has turned to our own way, and so the Lord laid on Jesus the iniquity of us all. He didn't do that because you were enough. We'll learn in John 15, verse 5, that apart from Jesus, we can actually do nothing. And we'll read in Romans 1, 18 to 20, that the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against the wickedness and ungodlessness of this entire world. For we saw God because he made it plain to us, and yet we chose to go our own way anyway. And so Ephesians would call us children of wrath. Romans would say we are dead in our sin. It doesn't sound, really, to me like we are enough. And if you search scripture for statements about God not giving you more than you can handle, I'll tell you, you won't find it anywhere. In fact, the closest that you'll get to this idea that God won't give you more than you can handle, and actually a verse that some proponents of this statement would use, is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. And this is what it says. It says, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I want you to notice a couple things about this verse. And the first thing is first. We can't take things out of context to make them agree with cultural statements that we like. So let's not do that. But the first thing that we need to notice about this verse is that it is not talking about all of life's circumstances. Like when we say God won't give you more than you can handle. This verse isn't talking about when your world is crashing around you and you're experiencing hardship. This is specifically talking about times of temptation and what happens during times of temptation. And what you'll see if you read this verse is that even in moments of temptation, Our ability to overcome temptation is not dependent upon ourselves. In the passage, it clearly says we are able to overcome temptation. Why? Because God is faithful. And because God provided a way out for us. I can't even overcome temptation on my own. Trust me, I tried. And so did you. And it didn't work. We are unable to overcome temptation apart from the Holy Spirit who illuminates for us the pathway out of temptation that God provided for us in the first place because he's faithful to us. We can't handle temptation on our own. I'd say that actually scripture as a whole teaches the opposite of this idea, God won't give me more than I can handle. You won't find in scripture very many examples, if any, of people to whom God only gave what they were able to handle. Instead, you'll read of great exploits of young men overcoming giants when no one else was willing to do it. You'll hear of God's people being trapped by their enemy and then at the last possible second, waters being parted so they could escape on dry land. You'll read about people who can't even speak right coming face to face with political rulers and demanding the freedom of God's people. You'll see story after story after story of God picking the most unlikely, unqualified people and then birthing in them a vision so great that they would never be able to handle it on their own. And in the midst of walking out that vision, they will experience hardship so great that they could never handle it on their own. And I'll tell you, 
that's still what God is in the business of doing today. I would argue that God will constantly give you more than you can handle. He will call you thing, to things that you don't think you can do. You will find yourself in situations in life that are harder and more difficult, that are more grievous, that are more devastating than you ever thought you would find yourself in. Life will constantly remind you that you are in over your head and that God has yet again given you more than you can bear. Life will consistently scream in your face that you are indeed not enough for the task at hand. And to be honest, I would say scripture agrees. God gives us more than our hands can hold. And we in ourselves are not enough. And it sounds bleak. It sounds hopeless. But that's not the end of the story. That's not where we're going to finish today. Because what you'll, you will quickly find as you cling to God's word and you trust who he is in your life, what you'll quickly find if you hold these statements up to scripture is that a more accurate statement might be that God will nev never give you more than he can handle through you because he is enough. That's the good news of the Christian life. That's the liberation that comes from the gospel of Jesus Christ. That it's true. I'm not enough. And that's okay. I'll remember two times in my life where I had to admit it and I didn't even know. One was when I was walking with a friend at lunchtime. I was working at UGM and I had just spent half an hour explaining like my whole life, my testimony, all of these things. And they kind of looked at me, and they, and you can disagree with them if you want, but they looked at me and they said, I can't believe that you've been through those things and, like, you still came out, like, pretty normal. You guys can disagree. That's fine. That's fine. And I had never been, no one had ever said that to me before, and then I realized, and I said to them, oh. And I realized in that moment, like, as I had just replayed my whole life, it's actually because God was so faithful to me. And that's why I said, I said, it was all God. It was all God. It wasn't me. The second time that came to mind as I was writing this message, it's when I was, for, when I was being installed permanently into this role. And I remember sitting in my office with Pastor Reg. And he looked at me and he said, Mike, are you sure you can do it? Are you sure you want to do it? Are you sure you can do this? And I said, Pastor Reg, I absolutely cannot do this. But God can do it through me. And that's the same thing that's true for all of us. That God loved you even while you were still a sinner. Even while you weren't enough, and he sent his son to die in, in your place and pay the price of your sin so that now you could stand in new life. Now you could stand in resurrection power. Now that you could actually recognize it's true, I'm not enough. And I'll continue to fall short over and over and over. And I will continue to mess things up over and over. I'll continue to try to go my own way in my own strength. But I have this thing called the Holy Spirit living in me. That in every situation will turn my attention back to God. And he'll remind me that because of God's work in me, we can do the things God is calling us to do. That even though I'm unworthy to stand before an almighty, awesome, perfect, holy God, yet because of the work of Jesus Christ, I can stand here nonetheless. That's the liberty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the good news, that I'm not enough, and I don't have to try to be. When it seems like I can't take what life is throwing at me, when it seems like I'm not perfect enough, and I don't have my life lined up enough, to accomplish the task at hand, I can just take a breath and lean back into the loving arms of God and realize that Jesus is enough for me. It's the good news. The good news of the gospel isn't that God won't give you more than you can handle. 
because we've all proven we actually can't handle very much. But rather, the good news of the gospel is that God won't give me more than he can handle through me. And he can handle anything. He has the whole world safely in his hand. You see, the promise of Scripture wasn't that we would never experience difficulty or hardship. In fact, we're actually told in Scripture we will. You can read it in John 15. Jesus says, remember what I told you, a servant's not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you also. Then he says in the next chapter, John chapter 16, I've told you these things so that in me you might have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. You will. But take heart, I have overcome the world. You see, the promises of Scripture don't say anywhere that people won't betray you. We're never promised that your loved ones won't pass away. We're not told in the Bible that you'll never lose your job or that money will never be tight. Scripture doesn't tell us that our families will always take care of us the way we wish they would take care of us. It doesn't promise perfect marriage free of conflict and difficulty. It doesn't tell us that school will always come easy for us or that that next promotion belongs to you. But what Scripture does tell us, the promise of Jesus Christ, is that by his own spirit, he will be with us in the midst of all of those things. He will walk with us, and he will get us to the other side of whatever season we find ourselves in today. And even if it doesn't happen right now, even if it doesn't happen today, that's okay. Because my hope and yours does not lie in the today, but our assurance rests in the eternity that we will share with Jesus one day where there will be no pain, or sorrow, or death, or crying, or despair, or decay. And until then, he is with us. We're told in Psalm chapter 46, 1 to 3, that God is our refuge and our strength, our ever-present help in trouble. And therefore, because he's our refuge and our strength, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Isaiah 41, verse 10, it says, Don't fear, for I'm with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, we're told, Do not lose heart. Do not lose heart. Though your outer self is wasting away, Our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing us for the eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. You see, God is with us no matter what you're trying to handle today. He's been like this for all of history. That's what you can see if you go to Scripture with these questions. That's what you'll see. You'll see that he was with Adam in the garden, and he was with Noah on the ark. You'll see he was with the Israelites while they were in Egypt, and then he walked with them in the desert. He empowered David while he was on the battlefield, and he spoke to Elijah on the mountainside. He redeemed Samson while Samson was bound in chains. He encircled Elisha in the city, and he protected Nehemiah while he built the wall. God was with John the Baptist in prison, and he was with Lazarus in the tomb. He empowered the apostles on Pentecost. He rescued them from shipwrecks and stonings. He has kept his kingdom advancing. He has always held his people secure, and his church will move forward no matter what this world throws at her. God is with us. God is with us. And what you'll see is, if you look at all of these examples and more is that none of these people were enough. They were all handed more than they could handle. 
Because God won't give you more than he can handle through you because he's enough. And I know some of you are probably sitting here all morning thinking, well, pastor, what about that one verse? What about that verse in Philippians chapter 4? You know that one that says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. What about that verse? And I'll remind you yet again, let's not just pluck it out. Let's read it in context because what you'll quickly see is that that scripture is not talking about just us being able to accomplish whatever we feel like we should do today. It's not about you acing your next test at school or dunking the next hoop in the basketball game. That's not what it's talking about. Instead, that passage is talking, of, it's Paul speaking of trials and difficulties that he had probably never bared before, at least not to that extremity. And he says, in the midst of all of this, in the midst, I've learned the secret to being content in every situation. He says, I've got a secret for you. Lean in. There's a secret to all of this hardship in life. And so Paul writes to the Philippian church while he is in jail for sharing the gospel. And he says, I've learned the secret to being content in every situation. It's that I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. He says that's the secret, that you would recognize that you can endure all things even the hardest parts of your life by the power and the strength of Jesus Christ. And so while we're taught in our culture over and over and over again that we have to endure everything on our own, we've been taught that God will never give us more than we can handle because you've got to handle it yourself and you've got to handle it yourself because you're enough. I want to give you an alternative. The good news. And the good news is that you have Jesus Christ, a great high priest who is not unable to empathize with you in your weakness. You have a great God in heaven who actually identifies with every single trial that you will come face to face with in this life. Because you see, the person of Jesus Christ, in Jesus, the fullness of God collided with the fullness of humanity and our great Savior, his name's Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he became human flesh so that he could identify with the ones that he loves. You have a great God who knows exactly what you're going through. You'll see it in the Bible. Jesus knew what it was like to experience poverty. It says in Luke chapter 9, verse 58, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He didn't have a home to call his own. He didn't make money of his own. He knew what it was like to experience poverty. And so for you as well, if you find yourself today in a season of lack, I'll remind you, God sees you, and he knows you, and he's with you. Jesus knew what it was like to experience exhaustion. In fact, you'll see him all throughout the Gospels retreating to pray on his own. You'll see him sleeping in boats and sweating blood as he agonized in prayer for you and for me. So I'll tell you, if you're exhausted today, he knows you, and he sees you, and he's with you. Jesus even knew what it was like to experience betrayal. He was betrayed by his own family in Mark chapter 3, verse 21. It says, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he's out of his mind. And then he was betrayed by two of his closest friends, by Peter in Mark chapter 14, and then betrayed with a kiss by Judas Iscariot in Matthew chapter 26. If you find yourself today betrayed by those you love, Jesus sees you, and he knows you, and he's with you. Jesus even knew what it was like to experience grief. 
In Luke chapter 19, you'll see him weeping over what was happening in the world around him. He's crying for the city of Jerusalem, for the state of affairs that he found himself in. And then in John chapter 11, you see Jesus weeping over the loss of a loved one, Lazarus. Even though he knew the hope that was to come, Jesus wept nonetheless. If you find yourself in grief, or you find yourself in mourning, Jesus sees you, and he's with you, and he knows you. Jesus even knew what it was like to be tempted beyond compare. In Matthew chapter 4, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil himself. And after fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, the tempter came to him. If you're stuck in temptation today and you don't know how to overcome it, Jesus sees you and he knows you and he's with you. And like we read already, he will provide a way out every single time. Jesus knew what it was like to experience suffering as he prayed for you in the garden and he carried your cross. He suffered. In Matthew chapter 26, Jesus says, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. If you are suffering this morning, Jesus knows you. And he sees you and he's with you. He even knew what it was like to feel forsaken by God. It was about three in the afternoon in Matthew chapter 27. When Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so for all of us who feel alone and forgotten and forsaken by God, I will first tell you, you are not. For he promises that he will never leave you or forsake you. We are promised that no one can snatch you from your father's hand. And while you work that out and you apply that to your life, I'll remind you that even while you're feeling that way, God sees you and he knows you and he's walking with you. And so it's my prayer this morning that we would just kind of get up and shake the dust off a little bit and we would break free from this bondage that says that we have to be enough. And we've got to be able to sort things out on our own. And instead, would we rest in the fact that we have a great high priest who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or imagine according to his mighty power that is at work within each and every one of you. And that our great high priest is not unable to empathize with us in our weakness. But he has been tempted in every way, just as we have been tempted, and yet he did not sin. And so we have this great confidence that we can now, because of the work of Jesus, and because we are confident that he knows us and he sees us no matter what life throws our way, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we might receive his mercy and find his grace to help us in our time of need. You don't have to be enough. And he can handle whatever life throws at you. Could you stand with me? We're going to pray together. I'm going to invite the prayer team to the front. I think it's clear by now that you don't have to be ashamed to come up for prayer because none of us have our lives together. Sometimes you just need prayer even if your life is going pretty good. So please, there's people at the back, there's people down the side, there's people at the front. We would love to pray with you. Let's pray together. Father, thank you. Thank you that your Holy Spirit is here and you, pro you tell us that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And so as many of us are even ramping up for this next season of life, God, would we recognize your freedom 
that we don't have to be enough. We don't have to have it all together. We don't have to handle everything on our own. But God, you'll handle it. You call us to just be still and know that you are God. You remind us over and over that it's not by our might or our power, it's by the Spirit of God that the things of God are accomplished. And God, we've been taught so many times that we've got to have it together and we've got to do it on our own. But would, we, would you look at Caribou Road and would you find a people who are marked by surrender to Jesus Christ? That we, don't, that we don't even love our lives, God, but we surrender them to you. Do what you want with them, God. When life is hard, would my first reaction be to give it to you, to lay it at your feet, and then just walk in obedience to who you are? When I'm surprised by the things that you call me to, when they seem bigger than myself, God, would I lay it at your feet and trust that you can do what you say you can do? When I'm overwhelmed, by the place that I find myself. But I hold fast to your promise that you are with me. That you are my ever-present help in time of trouble. Oh, would your people be set free today? Come, Holy Spirit. Would you minister to our hearts and our minds that we would take you at your word? That hardship will come. The storms of life will always rage around us. But our feet remain safe and secure upon a solid rock. And our hearts and minds are stayed upon you, God. For you are not far off you're living and moving and breathing within us. You're so good and so kind. So would you get all the glory and the honor and the good times and the bad? In Jesus' name.